For our first lesson on structured home wiring, let's start with the beginning of the network. Let's talk about a minimum point of entry, or MPOE for short. A legally significant conceptual location you'll need to understand and plan for if you want the best outcomes. First, a history lesson for everyone who wasn't already an adult in the 80s or before. AT&T once held a monopoly on the phone system. The whole thing. The stuff you would normally think, oh yeah, that's AT&T stuff, like the distribution nodes, their central infrastructure, the lines on the poles, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, they owned all that, but they also owned the lines in your house, the phone on your desk, or like hanging in the, on the wall in your kitchen. You weren't allowed to attach anything unapproved to their network or equipment. In 1956, Hushaphone won a declaratory judgment from the federal government saying it was okay for them to attach a simple physical cup-like device. No electronics to AT&T's handsets. Uh, AT&T fought them over that, just, just attaching a physical device. In 1968, Thomas Carter, inventor of the eponymously named Carter Phone, a cradle you could put a telephone handset into and talk over a radio with, like a modern ship-to-shore telephone, won a judgment from the federal government saying anyone could connect anything so long as it had an AT&T protective coupler attached. That was the first electronic device that you could attach to their network. This sort of no you can't until you spend a ton of money and time fighting us in court uh, and eventually maybe winning a, a judgment uh, market climate continued through to the 80s. This meant things like answering machines, caller IDs, and other features that even children of the 90s took for granted were effectively being suppressed, in some cases for decades. In 1982, that legal monopoly had completely vanished when Ma Bell was broken up by the federal government, and a concept of demarcation between provider and customer equipment became the new norm. The point of demarcation, or demark for short, is the point on the property where the cabling from your provider ceases to be the cabling from your provider and becomes the premise cabling that you are responsible for. For example, a simple demark might be one of these ABS plastic uh, enclosures that's on the side of homes. You've probably seen any number of them in your life. Uh, that's a, a good example of a DMARC. You bring telephone wires or cable uh, into this box, terminate it, and run it into the house where uh, it's your cabling from there on out. And then if there's any trouble on the line, you can come to this point and test it and see if it's the line or if it's inside the house. If it's inside the house, they say, well, we can fix it for money or go, go figure it out yourself. Um, if it's outside the house, then it's on the provider. Um, this becomes a place where you can test that sort of thing. A minimum point of entry is a subset of a uh, point of demarcation. Uh, the idea behind a minimum point of entry is you want to get this uh, point of demarcation as close as possible to wherever the provider is bringing in service from outside. All right, so a quick tour around this minimum point of entry uh, sample here. We've got uh, three three portions here. We've got this interior um, Leviton uh, low voltage box. This is like a 21 inch Leviton box um, I've got here. Um, though there are many manufacturers. Legrand makes some, um, Comscope. There's uh, a number of low voltage enclosure manufacturers. There's also two major types of them. Um, the standard type is a like powder coated uh, steel enclosure. Um, they all come with these uh, covers, obviously. Some covers are hinged uh, versus screw-on, but screw-on is more normal because you're not really in, in and out of these things every day. It's more of a once in a blue mood do you need to access them. Um, they also make them in uh, multiple sizes. The one I've got here mocked up with the piping here is a 21-inch uh, version, but uh, this one over here I've got for size comparisons, 42 inches. 28 inches is uh, seemingly the most common size that you, you see everywhere, uh, which is you know somewhere in between here, uh, between these two. Uh, I've, I've got this right here. Typically, whenever I see in a, in a home where the telecom stuff is coming in, it typically comes in near the power panel because in a, a new subdivision, they're, I mean, they're planning all this infrastructure out from the get-go, so it all tends to come from the same spot. Whereas in older neighborhoods, if you're doing a retrofit or a teardown in, a, in an older neighborhood, it could be anyone's guess where the power is coming from, where the sewer is coming from, where all that stuff's coming from. It could be different directions because it was all put 
happened differently and haphazardly and wasn't planned out. But if you're in a relatively new subdivision, relatively new area, uh, it should be pretty much all coming from the same spot. Most most homes I've ever been in, it all tends to come in uh, right in the same place. Uh, however, that's not quite specifically what you want to be doing with uh, low voltage sensitive stuff like Ethernet equipment or whatnot. Um, the IEEE standards say you want to keep that at least a meter away from high voltage. Um, so you don't want uh, to keep your minimum point of entry very, very close to this power panel. Uh, some people will want to keep it in like right next to each other and put it in a little closet to save space. You, you actually want to give it some healthy space um, because being too close is not great. Um, and then the final little piece of our puzzle here. Uh, on the outside, we've got this ABS box, and then we got the cabling that'll drop down into the ground here, and then go all the way out to the uh, cable box node, wherever that happens to be in the neighborhood. Um, so the minimum point of entry, you want to kind of keep it close on that, that side uh, with the cable box. Um, obviously, if it's out this side, then this side of the, the house uh, makes sense to put that minimum point of entry. There's a couple other considerations that we want to uh, talk about here because this cable box, oh well, all, all that you absolutely need it to be is a place that you could get at and then like rewire some cabling. Uh, it only becomes truly useful if you actually, you know, then hook it up to some other places in the house. Um, most obviously, um, you want to take it up, uh, to like a roof chase. If you can get it from there, if you need to have a second minimum point of entry, a second low voltage box, uh, up by the roof chase, or, um, you don't want you want to try and keep it in a conditioned part of the home. Um, so not necessarily in an attic, uh, that would be bad because you then you really wouldn't want to put any equipment in it at all. But, um, I mean, if, if you came down into the back of a closet on the second floor, if you absolutely had to, ideally you'd want to get from the roof all the way down to the basement on a relatively direct uh, shot. Um, if you can get to this box, then great. If not, then it's not the end of the world. But um, there's plenty of equipment these days that uh, benefits from a roof mount. The, the, because, our, because of how radio frequency technology works, basically the higher you are, uh, the more obstacles you can avoid, uh, the greater the Fresnel zone. And like it, just generally everything works better the higher you can get it. So um, if you're talking about sector antennas for a local wireless ISP, if you're talking about uh, antennas for the nearest like 4G or 5G tower, um, satellite dishes get mounted on the roof. Uh, at some point, Starlink, when it comes along, uh, when, they, when they got enough satellites up there, if you get a, a, a Starlink account, that'll also be a, a roof-mounted device. Um, all sorts of stuff of, that comes along um, over time. Generally, if I mean, if it's radio-based, it'll uh, benefit from a roof mount. If you want a cell phone booster for inside the house, for instance, that would also be a, a roof mount uh, solution. Um, because there's so much stuff that could potentially be mounted on the roof, if you uh, build a chase for cables all the way up to the roof and you know weather tight and you know plan it out from the get go, then whenever you need to roof mount something, it's not a crazy chore or some big endeavor or somebody staples more cabling on the outside of your house. Um, you've got this this handy chase there, so you just run the cabling all the way down and you're good to go. Let's talk about uh, the other things that you might want to put into a minimum point of entry. You know, technically, like the a roof trace is your minimum point of entry uh, for any sort of uh, RF based thing, and then uh, you know something like this box on the outside of the house, or uh, maybe even an underground cable vault or something is good for any sort of buried cable you're bringing into the the building. Um, the things we have to worry about here with the network rack and cable TV, um, maybe you don't necessarily have to bring them to this box if all you plan on doing is, you know, leaving wiring in here. Then you got an awful lot of space to put, you know, coax or whatever. But the uh, the thing to do typically, uh, most people will split the coax out coming into the house for the cable modem. Do that right here. 
then uh, do uh, maybe a little coax um, splitter here or you know two or three if you need them. I bet, I bet that's about max for this size box. Um, that's why they make the larger sizes. Um, the 28 is a little bit more popular than this because it gives you a little bit more room for cable TV and that sort of thing. The other thing that these boxes do that's not really shown here on the drawings is the bottom of them will uh, typically on either side have a uh, knockout for um, this uh, you know electrical plug. So you if you're you know finishing the drywall, then it's all you know nice and neat and contained. But if you're doing it in a, you know, an unfinished area or you know, some place where it doesn't particularly matter, uh, you consider you know, just doing a normal sort of plug here, mounting a piece of plywood or something, and then that way you can put a battery backup for any of the equipment you've got in here. That way when uh, you know, the power is out, you still uh, have your, your modem running and your, your internet, uh, internet up, uh, assuming your network rack also has a battery backup. But that's the, the thing to do to uh, keep everything powered uh, if you wanted to do that. But assuming you've got a, a setup like this sort of thing, um, then you want to bring all your coax from each place you run it in the house um, to here. Coax is something that you can normally daisy chain, and that's fine if all you're doing is you know TV distribution. But if you plan on maybe one day using it for data or... Uh, any other sort of use typically the, the best way to run any sort of cabling is in a uh, star topology where you uh, uh, run everything back to a central location like one of these boxes so if every uh, coax drop in the house ran back to this box um, then you can you know do all your distribution right here all handily um, and then in terms of the network rack um, if you put your modem here, then you'll have an Ethernet cable going out here, out to wherever the network rack, and you plug that into the router there, uh, and you're good to go. All right, so a note about the incoming coax. Like, uh, assuming you're getting a, a cable connection like uh, most households, um, the coax is coming you know, off their box out, out in the backyard somewhere or side yard or wherever it happens to be. Uh, buried underground and then you know coming up to this box on the side of the house into the house here um, the thing that we have to worry about is if you've got a lightning strike anywhere in the backyard it may uh, I mean all these coax cables are conductive so anytime you've got a buried cable outside there's a risk of if lightning were to strike nearby um, anything on that line becoming energized and frying so um, it could, in theory, hit anything that was on your coax network entirely because it'll travel right through these boxes. It'll, it'll fry that sort of thing. Um, you can ensure um, you've got a, a little bit of protection from this with essentially like an inline coax surge protector. Um, they, um, you know, make a nice one like this. It's got, uh, you know, male and female, so you just, you know, screw it on, and then you can uh, put it, you know, right before the, uh, the coax splitter to... Um, the cable modem and, and uh, off to these blocks so you're, you're filtering it right there at the house so anything out in the yard if it becomes energized uh, hopefully this unit will take one for the team uh, speaking of taking one for the team it's actually uh, it's got a little uh, opening in it here that you can uh, pull out these little 90 volt uh, gas fuses uh, so if it ends up taking one for the team, it's this little fuse that blows and then you can, you know, replace it. So if you buy one of those, just make sure you get a couple of uh, extra fuses and then uh, uh, that way you won't be high and dry waiting for like Amazon or something. Because, oh, I didn't know that there was this fuse or, you know, you take it off and just plug it in to get it working again and then, you know, never put protection back on it because uh, I'll do it later. So you can avoid that, get a couple extras to begin with, throw it in the, you know, the bottom of this box and... Uh, then, you know, that'll be good to go. Speaking of two-way splitters, um, the it used to be that for, uh, there's probably a lot of still bogus, well, now bogus information floating around out there on the internet. Um, it used to be that if you were doing uh, cable TV and cable internet, you wanted um, uh, filters that uh, only went from, you know, like zero to a thousand uh, megahertz. Um, and it would, you know, filter anything above that. And then for satellite TV, you needed something much higher in frequency, like 23, 2400, a lot of these filters would go. 
Um, so if you use a satellite filter on uh, cable TV boxes, it, you basically be letting in a lot of interference that you otherwise wouldn't need to. So you effectively are getting worse performance, but people will do it anyway because they see the bigger number and they think, well, bigger number must be better. But it's actually like, you know, leaving a wider opening for interference, essentially. That's that's what it is. So you, you want that band to be as small as possible while still doing everything you need it to do. Um, the modern uh, spec for delivering data over coax is uh, DOCSIS 3.0, and in DOCSIS 3.0, you basically need from 0 to 1800 megahertz. So they make filters that are uh, from 0 to 2000, and that's about as close as I've seen a filter. If anybody sees one that's like just straight up at 1800, that would be interesting to know. Um, but uh, typically, the, the thing to do... Uh, with one of these guys is go ahead and get a, uh, a, a zero to 2000 uh, megahertz filter and put that on there. Or, um, I mean, if you just wait for the cable guy to show up and, and hook you up, um, they will have, you know, whatever filter works with whatever their setup is. So you can just be like, here's where I want the modem mounted. And here's where you plug in for all the coax in the house. And then, you know, he'll end up putting a splitter right in here. Um, for you. Um, and then, I mean, if that's the case, give him the, uh, the surge protector as well. Um, the, the little surge thing here, it, it also needs uh, to be grounded as well with a, an additional uh, you know, grounding uh, setup here. So, I mean, if you've got an outlet in the box or a, sur a surge strip or whatever, I mean, you've got you know, ground access uh, through any one of those ports. So that's relatively easy to rig up here inside of the thing if you don't do a, an all-out grounding bar. Um, set up as well if you're doing like a, a server rack um, but you know I, I mean just tapping one of these outlets will do just fine to ground it alright so there you have it uh, minimum point of entry basic rundown uh, this is basically how it did, uh, works in, in concept uh, it's just a way to bring cabling into the uh, house uh, in or organized fashion and a way to uh, get at those cables uh, easily and uh, change them around or test them um, as need be. Um, that's a fairly easy concept. Um, if you're interested in any of the stuff I talked about in this video, um, I've got a, a link for a, uh, a kit uh, I put together, uh, including all the stuff that... Uh, uh, we talked about here, aside from, you know, the obvious building materials like, you know, the, the panel and the wood and, you know, tubing and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, any of the specific stuff uh, having to do with telecom uh, will, will be in that list. Thank you for watching the whole video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, you know, type them below. Uh, I will definitely get to them. Uh, <laughs> if nothing else to know, I'm not shouting into the void uh, for this first video, but... Uh, um, yeah, uh, please, a a anything uh, that might come up in the comments uh, will help inform uh, anything I do uh, for the next video. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I hope you learned something. Um, thanks, and have a good day.